Uh, one of our incipient initiatives is at the intersection between evolution and medicine. And as part of the process of developing that initiative, the ISO is running a series of workshops and similar events on topics relating to evolutionary or Darwinian medicine. So I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's talk, which is the kickoff of a fabulous three-day celebration uh, and the second of the series of that series of events exploring the connection between the many connections between evolution and medicine. I'd like to thank the biology department for hosting us today and Professor Peter Zimmerman from the Center for Global Health who organized uh, much of this with the assistance of Michael Bernard from biology, uh, Darren Croft from anatomy, Patricia Princehouse who's with the ISO, and Kara Halden who's also with biology and the Center for Global Health. Right? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Zimmerman to tell you more about the workshop and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Well, I have a few slides that I'll go through and uh, cover some of the things uh, in a few more bits of detail. But um, first of all, uh, we couldn't really do this without the support from Glenn and the uh, Institute for the Science of Origin. So that's uh, my first thank you uh, for your support, Glenn. And uh, Glenn also uh, uh, recognized the organizing committee of um, uh, Patricia Princehouse, uh, Darren Croft, and Mike Bernard, and Carol Halden, uh, who have been helping me coordinate uh, this activity. Um, I'd also um, like to um, tell you a little bit about what we're, what, uh, what we're also going to be hosting uh, over the next uh, two or three days. So um, we have a series of four, four talks tomorrow starting at 9 o'clock in the morning um, featuring Helen Punkivska from Kent State University, uh, Rich Glor from the University of Rochester, uh, Phil Gingrich from University of Michigan, and also uh, John Avis will uh, wrap things up with a talk on phylogeography. Um, uh, that will be um, tomorrow from 9 o'clock in the morning to shortly after lunchtime. So uh, those are the activities for tomorrow. And then for uh, people uh, who are uh, hardcore data enthusiasts, we have a hands-on phylogenetics workshop that we're organizing uh, where Rich Glor will uh, uh, be the, the leader of this um, event. Um, people who are interested should have contacted Mike Bernard by now because uh, various uh, pieces of software are necessary. Uh, in order to do data analysis. And uh, if you're still interested in this kind of thing, Mike Bernard is uh, the guy that you need to see um, sometime after the talk today. Okay. So let me get on to today's talk. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, John Avis. Um, John grew up in Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan. He got his Bachelor of Science degree in fisheries biology at the University of Michigan, got a master's degree in zoology from the University of Texas, and he got his PhD in genetics at the University of California at Davis uh, with his uh, PhD mentor, Francesco Ayala. Um, John joined the faculty at the University of Georgia where he had a very productive 30-year career and, uh, and uh, recently retired in 2005 to take uh, his current position as Distinguished Professor of Ecology and Evolution at the University of California at Irvine, where he once again works closely with his PhD advisor, Francesco Ayala. Um, among many uh, uh, service activities and awards, I'll just read off the highlights that uh, uh, come to mind off of John's CV. He was president of the American Genetics Association in 2000, president of the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution in 2004. He was elected as fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in 1991. He was elected a fellow of the American Ornithologist Union in 1994, and I had the pleasure of bird watching with John this morning. It was a little bit cold. Um, <laughs> We saw many different shades of gray, and I appreciate gulls more now than I ever have. <laughs> and John was also elected as fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1994. John uh, 
of the uh, awards that you have received, the one that sticks out to me as I think the most impressive and most noteworthy here on the eve of Darwin Day is the Alfred Russell Wallace Award from the International Biogeogra Bi Biogeography Society in 2007. John has authored um, graduate students, keep this in mind that the, this is a benchmark to shoot for, over 300 scientific articles and 16 books. The most recent of these titles shares today's, the title for today's seminar. Uh, it's Inside the Human Genome, A Case for Non-Intelligent Design. Please welcome Professor John Avis. Thank you, Pete, and uh, thank you for taking me out birding this morning in uh, sub-zero, no, I, <laughs> it was at my request and it was a wonderful time and we saw some very nice birds, so I appreciate your hospitality and I want to thank you publicly for that. Okay, uh, you can see the title from t my talk today and it is entirely fortuitous, happenstantial, that this book was just released today by Oxford University Press. This is the official day of its release. <laughs> So I just got my uh, early copy uh, a couple days ago and then put, put it in the slide here. So the title is Inside the Human Genome, A Case for Non-Intelligent Design. Now I realize we're partly here today to celebrate uh, Darwin's birthday, 150, uh, well, 200 years ago, but 201. But um, of course Darwin really didn't know a whole lot about the human genome. Uh, but perhaps we can forgive him uh, for that oversight uh, because it wasn't, if you, even in, at the time I was born, I'm going to date myself now, that it was uh, about that time that it was discovered that DNA is the genetic or the hereditary molecule of life. Some people, when I was born, were still th entertaining the possibility that it might be proteins or some other organic molecule. Um, but it is also true to say that although Darwin knew, of course, nothing about the human genome, the Darwinian revolution that he spawned has a profound impact on our current thinking about the human genome and what it means, what, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, the phrase non-intelligent design in the title is uh, of obvious reference to sort of a different idea than the one I'll espouse today, the notion of intelligent design. And so I want to start by just uh, telling you a little bit about the intelligent design movement, if you haven't heard about this movement. Uh, it is the latest incarnation of uh, religious creationism. It follows very close on the heels of its intellectual predecessor, which was sometimes known as creation science, which is a misnomer if there ever was one. It has everything to do with um, de novo creation and very little to do with science. Um, in any event, the creation uh, science movement and the intelligent design claim that biological features were crafted ex nihilo by a cognitive agent, that is to say a creator god, sometimes just uh, in some versions just a few thousand years ago. It routinely promotes the idea that supernatural explanations for life should be taught alongside of or perhaps even instead of evolutionary biology in science classrooms. Um, now, the creation science movement and um, the creationism in general have uh, taken this argument against evolution often to the courts, and uh, I've listed here four or five of uh, courtroom decisions in the United States, uh, which have consistently, except for the Scopes trial, which was the original one back in 1925, recall that John Scopes was a high school teacher who admitted violating a law in Tennessee that forbade the teaching in public schools of any theory that, under, that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible. And the Tennessee court did indeed find uh, Scopes guilty as charged. Uh, the creationism movement has uh, spawned a number of other court cases. These other court cases, two of them have reached the Supreme Court in 1968 and 1987, have consistently ruled against the plaintiffs, which in this case is against ruling, that is to say, ruling against creationism. The latest of these was the famous uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover Area School District decision in 2005, and I just want to read uh, 
uh, you can probably read it yourself, the one quote from the uh, judge's ruling in that court case. Uh, the judge wrote in one uh, portion of his decision, it was a long decision, but an intelligent design is not science and cannot be adjudged a valid accepted scientific theory. ID, as noted, is grounded in theology, not science. Moreover, ID's backers have sought to avoid the scientific scrutiny which we have now determined that it cannot withstand by advocating that the controversy, but not ID itself, should be taught in science class. The judge went on to say this tactic is at best disingenuous and at worst a canard. Um, now, proponents of ID sometimes um, seem to uh, promote uh, what I would consider to be falsehoods about evolution, and I've listed some of them here. Um, one refrain that you'll often hear is that evolutionary processes are simply too unsophisticated to yield complex biological outcomes. Something else you hear quite often is that evolution equals random chance. Uh, this argument from the ID proponents for, uh, overlooks the, the notion that uh, natural selection is, in fact, quite the antithesis of chance. Another common argument from the ID pe people is that complexity equals evolutionary improbability. Again, they're conveniently forgetting that complex trait under evolutionary scenarios can be built step by step. They don't have to come all at once. And perhaps one of the most insidious charges that's often leveled against evolutionary biologists by the creationists is that evolutionism necessitates atheism. Um, that's easy to refute, and uh, I won't go and spend much time at it, except to say I just here's a few uh, counterexamples to that. Think about Theodosius Stobchansky. He was my academic grandfather and one of the leading evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. He once wrote in American Science Teacher that I am a creationist and an evolutionist. Evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. And similar sentiments uh, to that have been expressed by many, many people. S someone you've, I'm sure, heard of is Frank Lloyd Wright, the, the famous architect. He said, for example, I believe in God, only I spell it N-A-T-U-R-E. You can even go back to Charles Darwin in The Origin, and uh, his concluding very famous sentence was, there is grandeur in this view of life, this evolutionary view of life, originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. So it's not necessarily the case that uh, one has to be an atheist to be an evolutionary biologist. One can, uh, a lot depends on your definition and your concept of, uh, of God, if you will. In any event, here's a brief history of the modern version of the intelligent design movement. It all kind of began in, back in 1984 with the publication by Charles Thaxton and a couple others of a book called The History of Life's Origins. These authors were associated with a Dallas-based Christian organization called the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, or FTE. Uh, the FTE published soon thereafter another book. Uh, this was a high school biology textbook called Of Pandas and People. And it was, it was adopted for use in the science classrooms of, in, in at least a couple of states uh, back in the late 1980s. A somewhat better received book uh, by the uh, more broadly uh, popular was a 1991 publication called Darwin on Trial by Philip Johnson, who was a law professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, perhaps his association with Berkeley gave greater credibility to some of the arguments that were presented in his book. In 1991, uh, Bruce Chapman founded the so-called Discovery Institute, or DI, which is based in Seattle. This is explicitly devoted to challenging Darwinian theory, promoting intelligent design, and exploring how what they call scientific materialism negatively impacts uh, human culture. So those are some of the, uh, that's a brief thumbnail sketch of the history of the intelligent design movement in North America. But unquestionably, one of the flagship books, probably the flagship book of the intelligent design movement was uh, Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution by Michael Behe, which was published in 1996. And this was a, a Michael Behe is, is a biochemist, and the, he looks through, from a biochemist's point of view, uh, at the complexity of life and concludes in this book that it couldn't possibly be of natural origin. It had to be of uh, intelligent design. And here's a, 
a quote from his book, from Behe's book. He says, the results of these cumulative efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level, is a loud, clear, and piercing cry of design. The result, he said, claims, is so unambiguous and so significant that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science, as momentous as the observation that the Earth goes around the sun or that disease is caused by bacteria. Now, of course, evolutionists didn't necessarily take Behe's arguments sitting down. They struck back and uh, in, uh, wrote responses. One of the most famous of them was uh, this 1999 publication, Finding Darwin's God by Ken Miller. Um, and here he, Miller writes, Michael Behe's purported biochemical challenge to evolution rests on the assertion that Darwinian mechanisms are simply not adequate to explain the existence of complex biochemical machines. Not only is he wrong, Miller writes, but Behe is wrong in a most spectacular way. The biochemical machines whose origins he finds so mysterious actually provide us with powerful and compelling examples of evolution in action. So that was typical of the kind of response from the scientific community to Behe's book. It was dismissal and the, the counterclaim that evolution can indeed account for the uh, origins and appearance of complex biological outcomes. And I find it quite interesting, in fact, that many scientists, after Behe's book came out, set to work, they redoubled their efforts to look at some of the classic examples of purported intelligent design that Behe had promoted in his book. One of them was the bacterial flagellum. Behe spends a lot of time talking about this incredibly complex tail of a bacterium and how it couldn't possibly uh, have arisen by any sort of natural process. It required supernatural intervention. Um, and lots of, uh, I, I, I doubt that many biochemists would necessarily have looked at the, at the bacterial tail had it not been for the kind of stimulation provided by Behe, but lots of scientists did, a lot of molecular biologists. And uh, Liu and Achman, for example, uh, published an art, a response back in, 19, in PNAS a few, few years ago, wherein they dissected the uh, bacterial flagellum in great biochemical molecular detail and uh, published in PNAS, uh, Stepwise Formation of Bacterial Flagellar System. I've taken several quotes from that paper here. Uh, Liu and Ackman write that we identified all flagellar proteins encoded by the complete genome sequences of 41 flagellated species from 11 bacterial phyla. Phylogenetic relationships among these genes suggest the probable order in which structural components of the bacterial flagellum arose. And perhaps most importantly, they concluded that the results show that core components of the flagellum originated through the successive duplication and modification of precursor genes. There were a series of additional papers that followed this some challenging, in fact, these authors and saying that uh, some of the supposed homologies that they had identified weren't uh, adequately documented. But be that as it may, I find it very interesting that almost certainly in partial response, at least, to Behe's book, um, scientists have looked in greater detail at some of the systems that Behe highlights as not possibly being capable of being produced by evolution. Things like the vertebrate eye is another example and vision and so on. And at least we can say that science seems to be making progress in dissecting these traits and understanding their basis and how they could have evolved uh, through natural processes. But what Behe really was doing in his uh, Darwin's Black Box books was reiterating a th not, not a new theory, as he claimed, or not a new idea, but rather an idea that's as old as the hills. It's the idea of natural theology. It's the idea that Wherever you look in nature, you see beauty, you see complexity, you see wonders. How could this be anything other than the product of a supernatural deity? One of the earliest proponents of natural theology, and in fact where the term came from, is, uh, was William Paley, who way back in 1802 wrote uh, Natural Theology. Uh, Paley, it's a beautiful book actually, you should go back and read it if you haven't seen it. It's eloquent, uh, he's clearly a knowledgeable biologist. This is a picture from the frontispiece of that book where you can see things like an elephant's tusks and trunk are pictured as are some bird bills and some insect wings and so on. Paley was a good biologist. He knew a lot. He was very observant. 
uh, and he saw everywhere in nature evidence of God's hand, of God's design, of God's existence and God's beneficence. And that's what natural theology was all about, this notion that complexity and beauty in the biological world is prima facie evidence uh, for supernatural, uh, for crea creativity, intelligent creativity by a loving, caring God. Now, Charles Darwin himself was a natural theologian when he boarded the HMS Beagle back in 1831. Um, Darwin later wrote in his autobiography that, quote, uh, Paley's logic, he had read natural theology, Darwin had, and he said that Paley's logic gave me as much delight as did Euclid. And it was the part of the academical course at the University of Cambridge which was the most used to me in the education of my mind. So Darwin was a natural theologian. And, but he wasn't, uh, but even Paley uh, wasn't the, the first to have these, uh, this notion. It, it's, it, it's centuries old. It goes back thousands of years, in fact. Um, but so, too, does a counter-argument to this argument from design. And it's the uh, question about imperfection and ugliness. If God is responsible for beauty and Wonder, wonder in the world, then what is to be made of all the imperfections and the ugliness in the world? It's not just that the world is, is beautiful, it's also got ugliness associated with it in many different ways. All of this, I think, was captured very eloquently and pith, uh, clearly by David Hume, who was a Scottish philosopher and historian. Back in 1779, he wrote a book called Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, where he had fictitious characters arguing with themselves, arguing philosophical matters back and forth, Cleanthes and Philo. At one point in the book, Cleanthes says to Philo, he says, the author of nature is somewhat similar to the mind of man, though possessed of much larger faculties, proportioned to the grandeur of the work he has executed. By this argument alone, do we prove at once the existence of a deity? And Philo's response to that, what surprise must we entertain then when we find him a stupid mechanic? <coughs> Charles Darwin was well aware that the kind of discoveries he was making about natural selection and the worldview that he gradually developed during his lifetime, uh, he was troubled by that because of its implications with regard to this long-standing uh, argument. And in fact, at one point he wrote in an apologetic letter to Asa Gray, who was an American biologist, regarding the materialistic implications of his book, Darwin writes to Asa, he said, I had no intention to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to be too much uh, misery in the world. So what Darwin is expressing there and what Philo was expressing in David Hume's quote, it's really theodicy, the age-old problem of evil. It's called theodicy. Theodicy is a formal term for the philosophical attempt to vindicate the justice of a loving and merciful God in establishing a world that is rife with evil and imperfection. Now, we can distinguish, of course, many different kinds of evil, or philosophers can. Uh, one example is moral evil or sin, which would be originated by people and often directed toward others. But we can also recognize what we might call exogenous evil. This would be things outside the human realm per se, things like tornadoes or earthquakes that can cause misery and suffering. We can also think about things endogenous to the human uh, body, to the human being, uh, pain and suffering. Think about appendicitis attacks or bad backs or any of a litany of other problems that we face as, as humans, especially as we age. Now, this the Odyssey issue, then, is just as old as is natural theology. Natural theology goes way back, but so does the flip side of the argument, this, this theodicy dilemma uh, that's created. Now, humans, of course, have, over through the ages, come up with all sorts of rationalizations for evil and imperfection in the world. I've just listed a few here. It doesn't hardly matter what philosophical persuasion you are. You've got a rationalization for it. If you're in, if you're a Christi or in Christianity, you might uh, excuse evil in the world, or explain it as humanity's fall from grace in the Garden of Eden. Or if you're an atheist, you might say, well, maybe God doesn't exist, and that's why there's evil. There's nobody directing things. Or maybe God died. There was a God is dead movement a few decades ago. Or if you're a polytheist, 
you might come up with something like maybe different gods have, di have competing interests and they're fighting it out and it's, the outcome is something like it would be made by a committee, not necessarily always great. <laughs> or you can do like Michael Behe does in Darwin's Black Box and that's just punt on the whole thing. You can say, I have no idea. You can say the reasons that a designer would or would not uh, do anything are virtually impossible to know unless the designer tells you specifically what those reasons are. Now that by itself pretty much defines out of existence the, the, the notion that uh, this is a scientific idea, this intelligent design. It's just, um, but it's not Behe that was the first to, to, to wonder about these biological imperfections, well either, or to talk about it. William Paley himself did in Natural Theology where at one point he wrote, evil no doubt exists, but is never the object of a contrivance. Teeth are contrived to eat, not to ache. Their aching now and then is incidental to the contrivance, perhaps inseparable from it. Similar arguments could of course be made for any of the other litany of hurtful phenotypes that humans display, like bursting appendices or hemorrhoids or varicose veins or bad backs or a jaw that's too small to accommodate all of our wisdom teeth, necessitating all the dentists work that we have to do, or a birth canal that's almost too narrow for an infant's head, and so on and so on. Under Darwinian evolution, by sharp contrast, bio biological imperfections come as no great surprise at all, for many reasons. Now, I've just listed some of them here. These are some of the kinds of examples of evolutionary rationales for biological imperfection. One thing we can say right off the bat is that biological outcomes are constrained by phylogeny or history. The evolution paintbrush isn't working with a fully free canvas, it's constrained in going forward with what biological products have come from the before, so that it has to work going forward with what it's been, what has evolved from the past. Natural selection is a non-sentient process. It's just uh, completely uncaring and dispassionate, as much so as is gravity. It's just an operation. It's just a process. Differential survival and reproduction. It's not something that's sentient. Furthermore, natural selection is not all powerful. Even if that is the directing force in evolution, the, the adaptation creating mechanism, uh, it's not all powerful. It's one in just a whole nexus of evolutionary forces. Another rationale for imperfection is that random mutations continually arise. Most of these are deleterious or fitness neutral. Harmful mutations may be invisible to natural selection, especially in small populations where genetic drift could play a large role. Uh, drift can alter population in, in ways that are uncorrelated with adaptive benefits. Sexual selection, that's another form of selection that Darwin wrote extensively about in his life, is on particular traits, often operates in opposition to natural selection. That might be another reason we'd see less than ideal outcomes. Genetic correlations and conflicts are common. For example, deleterious alleles linked to beneficial alleles at other loci can sometimes hitchhike with the favorable alleles and thereby escape immediate eradication by natural selection. Pleiotropy and fitness trade-offs are common. A particular genotype often has multiple phenotypic consequences, some of which may be beneficial and others may harm the organism. You could imagine, for example, a gene that early in life causes good, healthy, strong bones through calcium uh, accumulation might predispose towards atherosclerosis later in life and hardening of the arteries. And so that would be a pleiotropic byproduct of a gene that's otherwise favorable. And especially in sexual species, natural selection acts not only at the organismal level, but also at the genic level thus facilitating the evolution of selfish DNA, such as mobile elements that I'll talk about later today a little bit. These are examples of the kind of biological rationales under evolutionary thinking that can account for biological imperfection. It's not hard to understand from an evolutionary point of view. It may be from a religious point of view, but from, or from a theological point of view, but certainly not from the point of view of religion. So to uh, just uh, reiterate what I've said so far. At the time of Paley and before, the complexities and utilities of biological traits, such as the vertebrate eye or the bacterial flagellum, were taken as prima facie evidence for a supreme intelligence, that is, for a supernatural creator God. That was a thesis that was also reiterated by Michael Behe in Darwin's Black Box. Now, this c interpretation of Paley and Behe has seemed obvious not only to theolog theologians through the ages, but it was also obvious to almost everybody else. Um, 
It was indeed one of the five ways that St. Thomas Aquinas, quote, proved the existence of God. And likewise, it seemed obvious to almost everybody else. Here's a, a nice quote from John Ray in The Wisdom of God, published in 1691. He say, you may hear illiterate persons of the lowest rank affirming that they need no proof of the being of God, but that every pile of grass or ear of corn sufficiently proves that. To tell them that it made itself or sprang up by chance would be as ridiculous as to tell the greatest philosopher so. Now, of course, everything changed dramatically then after Darwin. After Darwin, the complexities and the utilities of biological features could be interpreted as adaptations that evolved via natural selection, presumably without direct supernatural intervention. This is the Darwinian revolution in a nutshell. And what the Darwinian revolution thereby did for biology was quite analogous to what the Copernican revolution had done for the physical sciences several centuries before then. That is, free these disciplines from the grip of theology and thrust them squarely into the realm where it would be possible to objectively and scientifically scrutinize uh, these fields. So the Darwinian revolution did that for biology. The Copernican revolution accomplished that same thing for the physical sciences much earlier. But all of this is lead-in to the question I want to raise today, and that is, what about the human genome? Is it a perfect contrivance? It's certainly complex. And Michael Behe emphasized all of the beauties inherent in it. But is that the whole story? Is the human genome truly wonderful, complex, the kind of thing to be admired and um, thought highly of? I'm going to argue that until rather recently, we really couldn't answer that question with any degree of assurance, we being scientists, because we didn't have the data in hand. We'd, you have to recall that it wasn't until 2001, February of 2001, in fact, that the first human genome was published, the sequence of it, in its entirety by Craig Venter and others in science and Eric Lander. A fierce competition had been going on between these two groups. It eventuated in the publication, the joint publication in Science and Nature of the first draft sequence of a human genome. Now, of course, a lot has taken place in the last decade, and a lot had taken place before then, of course, as well. But I'm going to argue today that the molecular results are now in. We now can answer that question I posed on the last slide. And these, the, the answer is that the human genome is absolutely riddled with structural and functional flaws. That's the case I want to make today. And I'm going to make it by going through three categories of design in the genome that um, I'll call fallible design, baroque design, and wasteful design. Fallible design, I'll go through each of these in turn in subsequent slides. But fallible design is, I'm going to be talking about that with reference to what are sometimes called good housekeeping genes, all those nice uh, 25,000 or so genes in the human genome that make proteins that go about uh, the uh, biochemical uh, housekeeping chores of the body and of cells. Uh, but a lot of them go bad, and I'll, and I'll show you just how many of them do. It's quite astounding. Then I'll go on and talk a little bit about what I'll call Baroque design. This is gratuitous or even ludicrous genomic complexity. Yes, the genome is complex, but sometimes it's ludicrously complex, not just somewhat complex, hopelessly complex. And one has to question how that could come about. And then I'll go on to say a few words about wasteful design, another category of incompetent design, if you will. Uh, and I'll introduce that through introns and pseudogenes and repetitive DNA. So I'll go through all of these uh, one in turn. Let's start with fallible design. And let's go back to 18, 1909, the early 1900s. At that time, it still was not yet clear to scientists or to anybody that there were inherent errors in the human body. I mean, you know, I mean, we knew about bad backs and so on, but, but at the biochemical or at the, at the physiological, the biochemical, the internal mechanistic level, it really wasn't very clear what was going on until Archibald, Archibald Gerard published a book called Inborn Errors of Metabolism. 
Now, Giraud was a natural theologian, and he wrote in the preface of his book, for if it be true that in every phenomenon of nature there is something of the marvelous, surely that factor is nowhere more evident than in the workings of the metabolic processes in living organisms. It's very much like uh, the kind of argument that Behe made a century later, but this was made by Archibald Gerard early in the century. But what Gerard is remembered for, and he might be, he might, I, I don't know, possibly regret being remembered for it, is not that quote, or that sentiment expressed in that quote, but rather the errors in metabolism that he first documented. He documented four inborn errors of metabolism and showed that they had genetic bases in humans and that the genetics was kind of like what Mendel had described uh, a half century earlier, but this was the same kind of genetics seemed to be at work in humans as well. Now, a lot has happened in the century since Gerard, not least of which are tremendous increases in our understanding of in what we what he would have called inborn errors of metabolism. Um, the sort of mo modern day analogs of Gerard's books, there's, a, there's several of them, but one of them is called The Metabolic Basis of Inherited Disease. This is a series of books that was launched in 1960. Another was Victor McCusick's Mendelian Inheritance in Man, which was launched in 1966. These are now, of course, online co compilations. There were several volumes that came out over the years at various number of year intervals. They're now online, they're updated weekly biweekly, and they detail, in excruciating detail, thousands of, thousands of metabolic errors. So it was back in 1909 that the first of these kinds of errors came to light through Archibald Gerard's work. Gerard had profiled four disorders in inborn errors of metabolism, alcaptanuria, pentasuria, cystinuria, and albinism. That was it. That was what was known at that time. Today, in the metabolic basis of inherited disease, or MBID. This is an incredible tome when it's printed. It's more than 6,000 pages long. It consists of more than 250 chapters, each written by leading experts in their respective inborn errors of metabolism. It profiles more than 500 genetic disorders that are incredibly well characterized at the genetic level, at the biochemical level, at the physiological level, at the diagnostic level, everything you can imagine. If you want to uh, delve anywhere into that book, uh, you'll be amazed at just how much information has accumulated in the century since Gerard. Likewise, in Mendelian Inheritance in Man, or MIM, several thousand genes are profiled in incredible detail, and about 75% of those are well known to be associated with particular human uh, genetic disorders, genetic diseases. So, we now know that uh, whoever's in charge, or whatever's in charge of creating uh, the human condition, uh, it's a fallible entity, or there's a fallibility to the process, at least with respect to the notion that's now well documented that humans have all sorts of inborn frailties, inborn problems that arise through muta de novo mutations arising and segregating in human populations that create horrible disorders, just awful things that you never would want to have. Just a whole litany of such disorders. And uh, that is something we know, we, I think we can say we know now for certain. There is that kind of fallibility to whatever process has generated this uh, human aspect of the human condition. So that's, that's error-prone design. There's also the uh, category that I call Baroque design. This is gratuitous complexity as opposed to an economy of design. I mean, you might argue, for example, that if a supernatural agent were in charge and it had carte blanche to do whatever it wanted, uh, you might expect to see complex complexity, but you might also expect to see economies of design. Why be sloppy or do things that are unnecessarily or needlessly complex? And yet, when you look in, in close detail at the human genome, you see that it is just filled with all sorts of Machiavellian, Baroque, bizarre designs that evolutionary biology can explain, but I think it's much more difficult for proponents of intelligent design uh, to come to grips with. Let me just give four examples of that very quickly. Split genes. It was a few, not too long ago, that it was discovered that split genes uh, exist. They are composed of exons interspersed with introns. I'll say a few words about that. Then I'll talk about gene regulation and nucleic acid repair. Uh, 
Then I'll say a few words about genomic imprinting, and then finally about mitochondrial DNA. So split genes were discovered in 1977 by R Richard Roberts and Philip Sharp. They won a Nobel Prize for their efforts in 1993. What they discovered was that uh, a gene is not a consistent, a, a structural gene, a protein coding gene is not uh, a consistent uh, piece of coding sequence, but instead it's comprised of uh, mostly introns. Introns compose about 97 percent of a typical protein coding gene, meaning that the actual protein coding section is only uh, 3 percent of the DNA sequence. What this necessitates, this split gene configuration, is a tremendous amount of processing for the pre-messenger RNAs. And all of this rigmarole must add a huge metabolic burden, uh, burden to cells. For example, there's a structure called the spliceosome. Um, and about 1 percent of all loci, amazingly, in the human genome encode subunits that go into this thing called the spliceosome, which is involved in RNA processing, splicing out, cutting out the introns, splicing together the exons in proper order and proper sequence so as to make a mature messenger RNA, which then can be uh, translated eventually into a protein. Um, but it's a tremendously complicated process. Can't begin to even illustrate it with just a diagram, but it's, it's amazingly complex. And my point would be that all of this molecular messiness also undoubtedly invites many additional errors, often with disastrous health consequences. Uh, here are some examples of metabolic disorders that have been uh, shown to be due to errors in RNA splicing. The spliceosome doesn't always work properly. There's mistakes made. Things are put together in the wrong order, out of order, backwards. Things can go wrong, and they do go wrong, and they have consequences for human health. Here's a bunch of different uh, d diseases uh, just to illustrate. I mean, it's a long, long list, but, but these are some that are especially well documented. Genetic regulation and nucleic acid repair. Uh, proper genetic regulation is a monumental uh, task for cells. You've got regulatory controls coming in at the transcriptional level with the pre-messenger RNAs, at the, in the pro RNA processing, at the translational level, at the level of proteins themselves in delivering, producing, the, tr translating the proteins, delivering them to the proper place in the cell. There's opportunities at all these different stages for uh, genetic regulation to occur, and occur it does. There's regulatory pathways at all of these different uh, stages. Just to take transcriptional regulation as one, one of all of these examples, uh, there's uh, a whole biochemical machinery that's involved in uh, regulating uh, protein production at the transcriptional level. Um, and again, at all of these stages in the process, all sorts of things can and do go wrong. Um, examples of some of the metabolic, metabolic disorders that are due to one or another form of error in genetic regulation are by definition all thalassemias. Thalassemias are globin, are errors in globin production, uh, in the amount of uh, hemoglobin, for example, produced. Most if not all cancers represent a, a breakdown in gene regulation or in cellular regulation at one or another of these many uh, levels. There's the whole topic of genomic imprinting. Uh, imprinting our mechanisms such as DNA methylation by which the expression of an allele depends on whether that allele came from an individual's father or its mother. Uh, it's yet another source of numerous health problems in Homo sapiens. Uh, here's a, a list of some of the metabolic disorders that have recently been shown to be due to errors in genomic imprinting. Again, um, whatever's going on here, there, there's an awful lot of complexity, but it doesn't always result in ideal outcomes, at least from the perspective of health, human health. Quite the contrary, the complexity generates or seems to generate all sorts of metabolic disorders. But the most egregious example oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I've saved uh, what I think is the most egregious example, perhaps, of this Baroque design. Uh, for last, which involves the mitochondrial DNA genome. We talk about the human genome, and normally you think about the nuclear genome, but there's a second genome. There's another genome, and that's the mitochondrial uh, genome that's housed in the cellular cytoplasm. And you can go back one, yeah. Back. There we go. That's it. Thank you. So, um, 
We now know that, we now think we know, as science has shown, that mitochondrial DNA in humans is a decrepit remnant of the genome of a bacterium that long ago invaded or was engulfed by a proto-eukaryotic cell. It uses a different genetic code from nuclear DNA so the two genomes can't effectively cross-translate even though they have to interact to produce uh, the biochemical energy that our cells use. An interesting fact is that mitochondrial DNA in its genome itself carries none of the genes that are involved in its own replication, transcription, regulation, or repair. All of those functions are encoded by genes that are housed in the cellular nucleus. What a crazy state of affairs that is. Who designed that? Indeed, uh, mitochondrial DNA carries genes for only a few of the components of its many biochemical functions. Um, electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation are mediated in mitochondrial DNA, but mitochondrial DNA doesn't do this by itself, or it doesn't encode the components that are necessary to do those tasks. Most of them are encoded by the nuclear genome. They're imported into the mitochondrion where they interact with mitochondrial subunits to form this hodgepodge, this pastiche of subunits that go into the electron transport chain. It's just a crazy uh, configuration, one would think. If you're an engineer working for GM or something and you put something like this together and said we want this to be our functional, the heart of our cellular operations, you'd get laughed out of the shop and say design something sleeker and more efficient than that. This is crazy. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, there's a lot of examples of metabolic disorders due to errors in mitochondrial function, either in the mitochondrial DNA molecule per se or in nuclear genes that affect mitochondrial function. And again, I've just listed a whole bunch of these, but for any one of these, you could go into that MMBID and pull out a chapter that's on it and learn in excruciating detail everything you ever wanted to know about what's going on mechanistically that underpins each of these um, various sort of disorders. I starred one here called Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy because that was one of the first genetic disorders that was discovered to be associated with mitochondrial DNA. And it was the kind of thing that had been overlooked by the medical community for nearly a century because they weren't accustomed to looking for a cytoplasmically housed genome or one that was maternally transmitted across the generations and so on. But now that people are looking at closer uh, depth at mitochondrial DNA, they're just discovering a whole litany of uh, problems that are created by this complexity of design. So that's Baroque design. I'll go on now to what I'll call wasteful design, which we're basically talking about now, repetitive DNA, a different, another category of um, infelicitous design. And I'll go through four examples, duplicons, pseudogenes, microsatellites, and mobile elements. Duplicons are genes that are just duplicated one or a few times in the genome. And it was appreciated long ago, in fact, by Susumu Ono in a book, Evolution by Gene Duplication. The importance of gene duplication is not in dispute. Uh, we know that it provides a lot of the fodder for evolutionary change. Genes duplicate, and you now got two copies where you formerly had one that in a sense, in effect, frees one of the copies to evolve perhaps in a new direction, assume some new role for a cell. Certainly gene duplications uh, can be important evolutionary fodder, but the point I would want to make today, I'm not emphasizing what's good about the genome, I'm emphasizing what's bad, if you haven't caught on to that yet. So here are some examples of duplicon-related disorders. These are typically caused when you have duplicons that create too much of a protein product or too little of a protein product or a lot of times you get problems with illicit recombination between the duplicated loci. So these loci, they're homologous in a sense. They have a common evolutionary origin and they have a lot of sequence similarity. There can be misalignment. There can be uh, illicit recombination between them. And the net effect is a whole, another whole litany of human genetic disorders caused by directly or indirectly by this duplicon process. Pseudogenes, another evidence of wasteful and kind of crazy design. There's about 15,000 pseudogenes. These are deceased loci, dead, dead genes. They, they no longer perform a function for the cell that we know of in most cases. There's about 15,000 pseudogenes that have been identified to date in the human genome. That means there's about one pseudogene on average for every known functional uh, protein coding gene. These are useless derelicts, presumably wasteful of a cell's resources. And they can also cause metabolic problems, for example, by recombining improperly with their related functional counterparts. And again, there's a whole uh, litany of diseases associated with that. Another category of wasteful design is microsatellites. These are these simple sequence repeats. About 3% of the human genome consists 
of these simple sequence repeats, they're thought to arise as little mishaps during DNA replication. And most of them have no demonstrated functional utility for a cell, but they are associated with quite a, another array of metabolic disorders in humans. Uh, the most famous of these disorders is Huntington disease. This is a fatal neurological disorder characterized by progressive dementia beginning in middle age. It affects about one in 10,000 people. It's uh, due to a mutation in, a, uh, in chromosome four that results in uh, more than 35 CAG repeats tandemly aligned. If you, there's diagnostic tests now for this. If you want to know if you're going to be die from this fatal neurological disorder, you can find out. Just have your DNA checked. And if you have more than 35 copies of CAG at that position in chromosome four, you're in trouble. If you don't, you're probably okay, at least with respect to Huntington disease. Mobile elements. These come in several categories, like lines and signs and LTRs and so on. There's literally millions of copies of these in the human genome. And this, is, to me, is the most astounding of all the features of the human genome. Collectively, these mobile elements account for at least 45% of our DNA. And that's almost certainly a minimal estimate because it neglects all, uh, the true number is probably closer to 90% if you take into account the fact that much of our DNA is dead or decomposed former mobile elements that have degraded since their death and become part of the hummus or the background of the genome so we don't even recognize them as such. But even if you put those aside, there's a large fraction of the D DNA, of our, of our DNA, that's made up of these mobile elements. And when you look at them functionally and structurally, they closely resemble viruses, especially retroviruses, both in their structure and in their activities. And they are the cause of countless metabolic, mal metabolic malfunctions, often with horrific health consequences. And again, I've listed some of them here. And just to mention, one of them is this, you know, you go through these long lists and it become kind of mind-numbing, but when you actually read about some of these disorders and the, the poor families that have to live with them and stuff, it's just awful, awful. leach nyan syndrome is a horrific neurological dysfunction that leads to uncontrollable compulsions for vomiting and self-mutilation in children. It's just, who designed that? Um, it's a horrific kind of a thing. So. What I'm trying to say is that humanity, our genome, uh, we have a tremendous genetic burden. Molecular deficiencies and dysfunctions are pervasive in the human genome. There are thousands of genetic disorders, many being horrific almost beyond belief, that plague our species. These genetic orders often afflict even the most helpless and innocent among us, including unborn embryos and fetuses. About 5% of all people are afflicted with obvious genetic disabilities. Genetic defects account for nearly 50% of all pediatric and adult admissions to hospitals. About 20% of human pregnancies end in spontaneous miscarriages, and many of these have genetic etiologies, meaning that there are more than 20 million such miscarriages worldwide uh, per year. Whatever is in charge of all of this stuff is the world's leading abortionist, is what I'm trying to say there. If aging and non-accidental deaths are to be included in the tallies, then essentially everyone, every one of us in this room, everyone in, on Earth, will sooner or later be felled by a molecular genetic disability or malfunction. We're all going to die, and ultimately our mitochondria are going to fail. Something genetic is going to fail if an automobile accident doesn't get us first. So unequivocally, I'm concluding, the theodesic challenge that I started this talk with can now be seen to extend, we now know this unambiguously, even to the deepest molecular recesses of the human condition. In other words, imperfection and evil, if you will, the molecular equivalent of evil, the, the biochemical equivalent of evil, seem to exist deep within us. No longer is there a possible refuge where we might say maybe perfection really resides. We've looked there, and it doesn't exist there. I don't know what next level we could go to to look for perfection, but it's not going to be found in the human genome. It is an incredible contrivance of evolutionary processes. Um, now, what I've emphasized today is kind of the reverse of what Behe emphasized in his book. He emphasized the beauty and the complexity of the human genome. And I'm not denying that such elements can certainly be found in the human genome, but what I'm emphasizing today, for obvious reasons, is the flip side of that. I'm emphasizing all of the uh, what the 
uh, one of the chapters in, one of, in the MMBID book, the MBID book, is called Morbid Anatomy of the Human Genome, and it maps out on all the different chromosomes uh, all, a lot of these genetic malfunctions. You might think that, gosh, this guy, this Avis guy is a gloomy Gus, isn't he? Or if you were Spirit to Agnew, you might have called me a nattering nabob of negativism, because here I'm dwelling on the negative. I'm emphasizing all this horrible stuff that's going on. Um, but I don't want to leave you with that message. I just want to have impressed upon you the fact that the human genome um, raises the theodicy issue once again. We can't just accept Michael Behe's comments at face value. We have to, to look at the other side of the coin. And when we do carefully, we find that he, he may claim that's evidence for natural theology, or that, uh, but we can also point out, as Philo did, what a stupid mechanic is involved in all of this because of all of the evidence of malfunction and and horrible design. But I want to close my talk on a more positive note so you won't just think I'm strictly a gloomy Gus. And, but I want to read this so I get it right. If so if you'll bear with me, this will be my lead-in to my concluding statements. In summary, from scientific evidence gathered during the last century, and especially within recent decades, we now understand that the human genome and the metabolic processes it underwrites are riddled with structural and operational deficiencies ranging from the subtle to the egregious. These genetic defects register not only as deleterious mutational departures from some hypothetical genomic ideal, but also as universal architectural flaws in the standard genomes themselves. These findings of molecular biology thus offer a profound challenge to notions of intelligent design. Namely, they extend the age-old theodicy dilemma traditionally motivated by obvious imperfections at the levels of human morphology and behavior, they extend that into the innermost molecular sanctum of our physical being. When describing the natural agencies of evolution that are responsible for such molecular flaws, I prefer the phrase non-intelligent over unintelligent or stupid. Natural selection, genetic drift, mutation, and other evolutionary forces, they're neither stupid nor smart. They're just non-sentient processes, as mindless as gravity and nearly as inevitable. Little wonder, then, that their biological outcomes often fall far short of designer perfection. Ironically, the human genome's many inherent flaws uncovered by the painstaking genetic research and interpreted in the light of evolution may be, and this is where I'm turning positive now on you, may be a glorious blessing in disguise for theology and religion. In effect, evolution can emancipate religion from the shackles of theodicy. No longer, I would argue, need we agonize about why a creator god is the world's leading abortionist and mass murderer. No longer need we query a creator god's motives for debilitating countless innocents with horrific genetic conditions. No longer need we be tempted to blaspheme an omnipotent deity by charging him directly responsible for human frailties and physical shortcomings including those that we now know to be commonplace at the molecular level. No longer need we be apologists for God with regard to the details of biology. Instead, theologians and others can put the blame squarely on the agent of insentient natural evolutionary forces. The evolutionary and genetic sciences can thus help religion to escape from the profound conundrums of intelligent design and thereby return religion to its rightful realm not as the secular interpreter of the biological minutia of our physical existence, as Behe would do, but rather as a respectable philosophical counselor on such grander matters as ethics and morality, the soul, spiritualness, sacredness, and other such uplifting topics that have always been of ultimate concern to humanity. My colleague at University of California at Irvine is Francisco Ayala, and he recently published a book called Darwin's Gifts to Science and Religion. It's this sentiment that, that Francis, he shares my view uh, on things quite a bit, uh, at least in this regard. And he argues in, in that book, as I do in mine, that uh, really religion should be grateful to the Darwinian viewpoint of the world. Be precisely because it frees religion from this theodicy conundrum that has plagued theologians down through the centuries. It should be viewed not as an adversarial position with respect to religions, but rather as something to be welcomed and uh, an, an emancipator, if you will. <clears throat>
I would even go further than Francisco, and I have done so in one of my earlier books, The Genetic Gods, Evolution, Belief, and Human Affairs. Not only does an evolutionary perspective free religion from the theodicy dilemma, but I think it can be positively informative about the human condition in so many ways. I wrote in that earlier book that what the evolutionary genetic sciences point to most clearly is the important influence of genes, which are the genetic gods in my book, and they're protein angels, the, the incredible influence of these genes over many human affairs that traditionally were thought to be under the purview of supernatural deities. Thus, I contend that evolutionary biology and the genetic sciences can do far more than merely emancipate religion from the philosophical dilemmas of theodicy. They can also positively inform our attempts to answer typically religious questions about topics such as origins, fate, and meaning. So I see a whole new kind of a possibility looking forward for the relationship between evolutionary biology and what I'll call mainstream religions as opposed to uh, creationism and intelligent design. On the top of this slide is what I would think what most people would say is sort of, well, I mean, this is a tr traditional view, the, what I would claim is now an outdated view. The view that mainstream religions and creationism and intelligent design overlap and that evolutionary biology is the adversary out here in, the, in another box altogether, you know, something to be feared or hated or challenged. I see a vision for the future, perhaps, where mainstream religions will increasingly overlap with the evolutionary sciences, and that creationism and intelligent design will be the odd man out over here, sort of to the right. I think this is a promise for the future, it remains to be seen how far one can go, in, um, in wedding, or at least in more fully incorporating evolutionary perspectives into some mainstream religions in ways that could be mutually uh, perhaps beneficial. And finally, my last slide, um, since this is the Darwinian celebration and I want to end on a positive note, I just want to, uh, you probably know that in the origin of species, Darwin actually said it's not origin of the species, it's the origin of species. Darwin wasn't talking about humans in the origin of species. In fact, he barely mentioned humans. He said uh, much uh, will be learned eventually about humans, but that's, he had one, uh, one little, uh, one sentence was about all. He did write much more about humans uh, in The Descent of Man and, and, and se Selection in Relation to Sex. And I want to leave you with this quote because I find this one very thought-provoking, as all of Darwin's writings seem to be. But he say, man may be excused for feeling some pride at having risen to the very summit of the organic scale instead of having been aboriginally placed there. And this may give him some hope for a still higher destiny uh, in the distant future. So I'll close with what I hope is a, that sort of positive sentiment, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. for a very provocative uh, essay. Um, and this is now open for discussion. So the question is, does someone who believes in evolution have to be a deist? Uh, so much depends on what you mean by deist and what, what the concept of God is. I, I think you can be whatever you want. As, no, I don't think you have to be a deist. I don't think you have to be an atheist. Can just interpret uh, these kind of findings as, as you prefer. Uh, if you find comfort and you feel spiritually uplifting to you to think of a creator having set in motion in all these evolutionary forces, I find with me. Uh, that's, I don't think there's any necessary connection between theism and evolutionary biology. I think you can have different concepts that are compatible. The reason why I bring it up again is you mentioned all this stuff about the problem of not correcting the biology. Yeah. And I think that the problem is that you said that If you want to persist, as the ideas do in arguing that biological complexity 
prima facie evidence for a supernatural creator, then you are, I think, put in a difficult position by these discoveries about the human condition, uh, because they, they do indeed raise, like, once again, the age of the Odyssey dilemma, which has been a dilemma for theologians down through the century. It's not a new dilemma. People wrestled with it 2,000 years ago, and they're still wrestling with it today. So that's nothing new. What is new is that we now know, I would say unequivocally, from the field of molecular biology and molecular sciences, that the theodicy challenge extends right down to the very innermost sanction of our physical condition. See, before the molecular revolution, we really couldn't say that. You know, there was always the possibility. And B.E. kind of reflects that sentiment, although not, you know, in some parts of the book, that this is where perfection ultimately resides. So, kind of basically says, I don't want to get on B.E.'s case or neither really, I mean, you don't. Nor would I want to debate it particularly. But the point would be that we now know that B.E.'s way of looking at this, you know, and seeing complexity and the evidence of God's handiwork everywhere is only one way to, to look at that. And one can also see that there's a lot of imperfection, a lot of horrible stuff going on in there, one can say. And that that once again raises the, the age-old theodicy dilemma. So in a sense, there's nothing new under the sun except what the sun is about extend these age-old arguments into the new realm. to point out that there's nothing I've said or implied or meant to say today that rules out the possibility that many of these features that I've described as negative will sometimes prove to be positives. You can certainly make a case that introns have facilitated all sorts of evolutionary possibilities that wasn't, wouldn't be present if you didn't have split genes. You can certainly make a case that all of, that, all of these mobile elements uh, dead or alive are many of them have been co-opted by the, the the genome to play regulatory roles that would otherwise not have been there. Every new category of molecules that are discovered, these microRNAs, you know, probably play a big role in in gene regulation. There's nothing here that I didn't mean to say anything that these these are strictly negative. I'm just pointing out the negative aspects of them for purposes of making the case I was trying to make today. But I will say that if any of these things, like pseudo, a, lot of, a lot of pseudogenes, sometimes they spring back to life, sometimes they're co-opted for other purposes, I mean, all sorts of things are going on there. My bet would be on scientists rather than theologians to be the ones that would discover what those utilitarian functions are. I mean, what I object to, I suppose, is just to dismiss and say, well, they must be there for something without researching it and finding out what it is they're actually doing. So I'm trying to make a case for science, not against anything else. I think I take comfort in the fact that I think the human genome un explains a messy closet, a messy attic, a messy garage, and so on. You mentioned at the end of the talk uh, that evolutionary theory and genetics uh, kind of frees religion from uh, blaming God or creator for all these uh, mishaps in the genome. And all they have to wrestle with that. They don't want to. They just go wrestle with it. Um, so, you're saying it kind of shifts the blame, um, in a way, away from God, um, but if you believe that God created us or put this all in motion, then in indirect nature, he's still responsible. I mean, so, um, so I, 
that's just kind of baffling. I mean, if, if you want to respond to that. So, I mean, you know, so if you believe in the kind of God that Wachanski is referring to, or Darwin, when he talks about the Creator setting all of this in motion, it's a very different kind of God than some other people might have a vision of. And in fact, you know, most people that promote science and evolution are often damned by uh, proponents of, or the creationists are often on our case. So, um, I forget what my point was going to be. But, you, but your point is well taken, of course, that um, it doesn't remove, in principle, it doesn't move, remove the theodicy dilemma if you, if your perception of God is the, the mover that set things in motion, set evolutionary processes in motion, you still have to account, well, why would he do that? Or why would she do that? So, yeah. Chris? Yeah, um, come to the point where this idea of fundamentalism and creationism is sort of a corruption of that thinking of how to experience the world. And I found it very enlightening where you can sort of look at the world in a very scientific, logical way, and yet again to experience the world through the sense of myths and wonder and things that are in a very different way. So this idea of creating these two things together has been there a long time. very acceptable as an evolutionary idea. So that, that's the thing. I just have one point. You quoted your um, case uh, against intelligent design, the extent of it was against intelligent design, uh, the failure to take account of all these flaws in the genome, which I agree with. But what is less widely appreciated is that intelligent design does make one kind of prediction, even though many people say it makes no prediction. The kind of prediction it makes, based on Dee's concept of so-called irreducible complexity is that if you delete a single element of what he calls an irreducibly complex system, it will completely cease to function. This claim has been directly uh, disconfirmed in numerous cases. And I'll give you one human example. Back in uh, the early 1980s, there was a paper in Nature by a group from France, and they had discovered a woman 75 years old living in Tunisia who was missing four out of nine of her heavy chain constant region genes, immunological heavy chain constant region genes. So here, he uses the immune system as one of his textbook cases of irreducible complexity. And here's a case where he deleted almost half of the relevant genes of this particular type. And that woman was able to survive for at least her 75th year. Um, and there, you know, there's no end to such examples. In fact, Pete is involved in one of them, which is CCR5 which um, Delta 32 mutation, which affects resistance to uh, or susceptibility to HIV. And it's not absolute in conferring resistance, but it's incredibly impressive. And the only other effect that I've seen published, maybe to keep those more, is to make it a little bit more susceptible to West Nile virus. But that's a fairly modest phenotype for a, de a, a de quote, defective gene. Well, there, there's no end of our, there's no end of examples of against the, the notion of irreducible complexity that he makes a lot of. One of the, the popular ones that was circulated on the internet shortly after the publication of his book, he made a lot out of a mouse trap, for example, and how it had to have five working parts to ever catch a mouse. And if you didn't have any one of those five, you could never catch a mouse. So it evidenced that an intelligent designer, in this case humans, of course, had to make the mouse trap as opposed to it arising through natural processes or something. And on the internet, there was a time for a few years where people were showing examples of mouse traps that could be designed uh, with less than five working parts or with deletions of various parts, and you can still do the job. So that, that was kind of a cottage industry tactic for a while. But I, I get, kind of get tired, I guess, of the, part, partly what motivated me to write this book, apart from the fact that I kind of like 
to think about these issues and stuff. And, and I wanted to approach it from a very different angle. But um, it was the notion that evolutionary biologists always seem to be on the defensive. You know, like, I mean, somebody like he can come along and say, well, what about the bacterial flagellum, or what about the immune system? So you go and work out all the details of that, or as much as seems feasible, and but what about this? And what are, there's an infinite pool of those things. So I just wanted to shift the, get a different sentiment out there, and uh, explore it in a kind of a different way. Um, and it was fun, so. <laughs> well, let's thank John, and if you have any other questions, feel free to come on down and have a chat. Thank you.